drug science, the charity I set up um, following my uh, sacking from the ACMD some 10 years ago, has been really fighting. One of the major things we've been doing in our existence is fighting for a rational approach to cannabis. And, uh, you know, we thought we'd achieved it. We thought last year's announcement by the uh, chief medical officer that uh, cannabis was a medicine, was job done. But in the uh, ensuing, uh, it's now um, 10 months, I think there might have been eight prescriptions for medical cannabis on the NHS. And in the private sector, there have been many hundreds, but people are generally being charged over a thousand pounds a month. For me. So actually medical cannabis in Britain is still out of the reach of almost everyone. And so uh, I'll let you speculate whether this is a deliberate ploy by the government or whether it's just complete and utter incompetence or some combination of the both. But uh, the history, which is my job today, is, to, is will tell you that uh, we should definitely be open-minded to the possibilities that it's deliberate rather than accidental. Aha. Uh -huh. So I can now, uh, is it a clicker? Yes. So one of the interesting things about cannabis is its uh, history. This is a picture, recent uh, picture, you can see of a Siberian princess exhumed from the permafrost uh, in northern Siberia. And the, the paleopathologist discovered that she died from breast cancer and smoked cannabis to ease pain. So that's uh, two and a half thousand years of, uh, of the use of cannabis as a pain medicine. And in fact, it goes back beyond then documented records uh, almost 5,000 years ago of it being used both in Indian and Chinese medicine. And it's got a pictogram, which means it's, uh, it must have been important enough to be written about. And this one I rather like, this, this one suggested actually it wasn't just for medicine. Obviously, slightly more controversial, but uh, the, this particular paper suggested that uh, the people who they found using it weren't ill, or it was being used recreationally. It was being delivered in vessels which they thought were being used in a, a communal setting, which was therefore made them think it was probably um, being used recreationally as well. And it's pretty hard to imagine why it wouldn't be if it works. It probably started off being recreational. And there was an argument that the soma of the ancient Hindus was in part uh, a cocktail of cannabis, ephedra, and maybe mushrooms. Now, now hemp, the cannabis plant, was no, long known in Britain. Henry VIII decreed that every farmer in Britain had to grow a field of hemp to provide enough fibre to make the sails and the ropes for the British Navy but that was very low in THC content. And the first time that the uh, high THC version of cannabis arrived, uh, the first report is this one, 1689, the Royal Society. On the left-hand side, that's the actual text in the current, in the old, um, the original text. Here's a translation, making it a bit easier to read. An account of a plant called Bangi before the Royal Society. The effects are very strange at first. First hearing, frightful enough, very general and frequent. Uh, the powder being chewed and swallowed or washed down by a small cup of water does in a short time take away the memory and understanding that the patient understands not, nor remembereth anything that he seeth, heareth, or doth. In that ecstasy, but it becomes, as it were, a mere natural, being unable to speak a word of any coherence. Well, we've all met people like that, haven't we? Yes. <laughs> and from then on, it became a medicine and it was widely used. This is a, a nice selection of over-the-counter cannabis products from the 1800s. And uh, I, I just love this, um, this really interesting statement here. So this is a, 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 a treatise by William O'Shaughnessy, a pharmacist on the preparation of Indian hemp or ganja. Their effect on the animal system in health and their utility in the treatment of tetanus, which was a common cause of death in those days, and other convulsive diseases. And it's, so we've known about the anti-convulsant properties of cannabis for nearly 200 years. It's weird, we have to relearn them from 
children who are going to die if they don't get medical cannabis, isn't it? It's, kind of, it's truly an example of, which we see currently in terms of cannabis policy, people ignoring or denying the past. And man cannabis was a medicine uh, back in those days. The Queen's physician wrote the definitive treatise on medical cannabis. There you go, 1890, J. Russell Reynolds, the Queen's physician, was a noted advocate of medical cannabis. And he wrote, and for those of you who know how hard it is to get papers in the Lancet, to get 50 pages, which is what he got, that's a serious treatise. And that's the textbook of cannabis medicine, a remarkable uh, document. And Queen Victoria wrote letters in which we've inferred that she used cannabis to deal with period pains and the pains of childbirth. And uh, if it's good enough for her, I reckon it's got to be good enough for anyone. You know, it's <laughs> and in fact, it was legal in, in Britain until 1971. We helped, I'll tell you in the next slides, how the, the rest of the world tried to get rid of cannabis as a medicine. One of the, there were two examples of when, where British medicine opposed the uh, hegemony of American um, policy in terms of drugs. One was heroin and the other was cannabis. And we held out for cannabis as a medicine until 1971, when following a decade of pressure from the US, following the 1961 UN conventions on narcotics, in which cannabis was essentially said to be of no medical value. We held out for 10 years, and eventually we caved in. I don't know exactly why we caved in. They must have promised us something. Um, but uh, we caved in. But the grounds for caving in were not that the Americans told us to. Uh, that would have been too honest. The grounds for caving in were the fact that two GPs in um, Ladbroke Grove were prescribing medical cannabis and telling people to use it recreationally. It's kind of weird really that you ban a drug just because two GPs were using it off license, but that's what happened. That was the excuse. Um, but as I say, behind it was 10 years of enormous pressure from the Americans. In fact, every single drug law in Britain up, up till the Psychoactive Substances Act has been made at the behest of the Americans. Eventually, they got us to made us ban cat five, four years ago because they were irritated that we hadn't when they did. So basically, our drug laws have always been um, done, or we've always done what the Americans have told us. Uh, and then we exceeded them with the Psychoactive Substances Act. But don't get me started on that because I get chest pain. <laughs> so why are people against cannabis? What is, the, what is it? What's the origin of this uh, banning of cannabis that we're trying to overturn? Well. There's been a, a sort of religious opposition to drugs for a long time, and um, Islam banned alcohol, banned cannabis relatively successfully, and tried to ban tobacco and actually coffee as well, but with much less success. But there's been concern. Uh, in the 1890s, uh, an MP raised this question in the House of Commons, Mr. Kane. He asked the House of Commons to, amongst other things, investigate the desirability of prohibiting the plant. Now, in the 1800s, from about 1840 onwards, uh, the British Empire was significantly funded by the production of cannabis in India. The uh, East India Company basically <coughs> took over the control of the growing of cannabis in India. Uh, so that they stopped the locals growing their own. They made them buy uh, the stuff that we made them grow. It was a kind of classic uh, colonial approach to, to uh, making money. And uh, I'm at Imperial College, and I, when I teach my students about the history of Imperial College, I point to this great tower, the tower built to Queen Victoria. And I say, what, who funded that? And they say, well, you know, the Victorians. And I say, and what money did they fund it? And they haven't a clue. And I say it was selling cannabis to Indians and opium to the Chinese. At which point they, they look aghast and then uh, think I'm mad. But it's true. So the Indian Hemp Commission was the first major attack on cannabis. It was an attempt to prove that cannabis was dangerous. And the conclusions there are that the moderate use of hemp drugs produces no injurious effects on the mind and produces no moral injury whatsoever, which in modern terminology says it doesn't cause dependence or addiction. So they couldn't find uh, the, the suspected or desired uh, destruction of the, the psyche of India uh, as a result of using um, cannabis.
cannabis. So it stayed as a medicine. But the pressures continued, and here are the uh, basically the four pillars, the four attacks uh, that led to the prohibition of cannabis. In the 19th century, towards the end of the 1800s, Puritan movements began to develop. They, they focused particularly on alcohol, but they were concerned with other drugs, because in those days you could buy from your corner shop or your local pharmacy <coughs> tinctures not just of cannabis, but of also of heroin, of cocaine, uh, of opium, etc. And there were people then, as now, who would prefer that human beings didn't take anything to change their mind, and they were the Puritans. Uh, and then, I'll show you more about this in the next slide, Harry Anslinger and the DEA got into the act in the 1930s. And then politics became, uh, it got involved relatively soon after that and uh, has dominated the discourse ever since. But also there have been these other commercial interests. And although alcohol was the first drug to be attacked, it fought back and it was very successful. And having survived the uh, prohibition in the 1920s, the alcohol industry has now, I think, become part of the problem because it realized that actually, it, if we got rid of all other drugs, it would be the only industry left that people would uh, turn to to have any kind of altered mental state. So the alcohol industry is one of the powerful lobbyists against other drugs. And the pharmaceutical companies as well, they were also problematic in this because they couldn't then, as now, <laughs> commercialize plant extracts. Not very easily. You couldn't patent them. So when they discovered that you could take from the plant, from the opium plant, morphine, uh, and then sell it as a pure product, they, um, they got quite keen on getting rid of opium. And uh, that pr the principle of only allowing pure products rather than plant extracts has dominated pharmaceutical development and also the regulation of pharmaceuticals to a point now where we, some of you who are interested in this will have presumably read the nice guidance that came out last week, which basically says we don't believe anything that anyone's ever done in the history of the world unless a drug company has done a controlled trial and tells us what it means. Uh, we're not going to consider any other evidence, which is, a, which is ridiculous and outrageous, and I'm fighting it uh, very uh, strongly with a lot of evidence suggesting how wrong they are. But that kind of principle, that the pharmaceuticalization of medicines is... Uh, part of the problem as well. But the, the real turning point in the history of cannabis came at the end of the US prohibition of alcohol. As you know, it was not a great success. Alcohol was banned. It went underground. Every policeman in America was corrupted by the speakeasies. So they had to create a new force, which is now called the Drug Enforcement Agency. The untouchables, these, the policemen of alcohol who couldn't be corrupted, or most of them weren't, to deal with the mafia. So, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, that people, when you talk to politicians today, you can say, well, did, a, did prohibition of alcohol work? Oh, no, 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 terrible. Lots of crime. So why is prohibition of drugs working now? Now, let's change the subject. Can we talk about something else? It's even easier to understand, like Brexit, you know, I mean, there's, this, there's a double think always about, um, about the, the, the problems of prohibition, which we've known right back from the 1920s. Anyway, the, the head of the anti-mafia, uh, the anti-alcohol anti groups was this man, Harry Anslinger. And he became very, very famous. He had an army of 35,000 people. He liked to get in the newspapers. The second most famous person in America, best known person after, after Hoover the head of the FBI, more famous than the president because he was just filmed destroying pots of booze all around America. And then the Senate did a really dangerous thing. They decided he didn't need him anymore. They were going to make alcohol legal. So he faced losing his job and losing the job of his 35,000 members. And he decided that he had to come up with a solution. He had to create something else that was a problem since alcohol wasn't. So he decided to focus on cannabis and uh, as a sort of remarkable kind of premonition of t the current uh, approach to Mexicans he decided to rename cannabis as marijuana 
associate it with Mexicans, create hysteria about Mexicans bringing marijuana across the border into America, corrupting yeah, young men and young women. And you can see these hysterical covers, which of course are designed in part to uh, scandalize, but also in part to attract people to the, to the concept. And, uh, and having done that, they had to then pursue this lie that cannabis was a very dangerous drug. In 1934, it was banned in the States, and uh, eventually it was banned internationally in 1961 under the first UN Convention. Actually, at that time, the U US wasn't that concerned with the international situation, but was persuaded to uh, push for an international ban because there was an Egyptian who had resurrected hysteria in his country uh, in the same way as the Indian Hemp Commission uh, was uh, uh, concerned about uh, the harms of cannabis. This Egyptian doctor was convinced that if we, they banned cannabis, the, they could empty the psychiatric hospitals in Egypt. So he persuaded the US, uh, US to go support this international ban and the US agreed because they wanted some air bases uh, in Egypt. Uh, and so that's how it got its first international ban. Uh, but the problem got considerably worse. It was the problem was ratcheted up when Nixon decided to wage a war on drugs. And for those of you who don't know about this, Nixon was losing, was going to lose. He stood for a second term. He was going to lose. The war in Vietnam was going very badly. He realized he had to do something different. So he created the war on drugs to distract people from his failure in Vietnam. And it was an amazingly successful campaign. You know, you create an enemy, people who take drugs, hippies take cannabis, you know, black people who take heroin, and vilify them continually, and scare the public into voting for you because you're the only person who's strong enough to fight this evil. And it was a fantastic success. He won every state except Maine from a position of where he was going to lose. So the war on drugs was started then, and we've, we're, still, we're still fighting it. As I've said, the UK resisted for uh, 10 years to comply with the UN Convention, which said it didn't have a medical value, but then it did. And what it did, it, did, it put it into Schedule 1, and the Schedule 1 is a very, very difficult... Schedule 1 is like putting someone into a, into a prison, into a deep cell in a, the depth of the prison and throwing away the keys, because... It's a double whammy. It says it has no medical value and it's very dangerous. So you get two sets of keys and they're both thrown away. And uh, it serves, an in, serves a real purpose putting a drug into Schedule 1 because it then becomes impossible to research. And so you never get evidence with which to allow, uh, argue it should be moved out of Schedule 1. It becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now there was a little blip of hope back in 2000. The House of Lords in uh, 1998 produced a fantastic report and I have to say I was part of that part of the evidence uh, giving evidence to that and uh, I was rather skeptical about the medical value of cannabis and I my evidence to them was that if they believed it had medical value then there were preparations of THC particularly nabalone and dronabinol which were available for research but having given that evidence and having read their report I realized I was wrong I realized actually that I didn't know very much about medical cannabis that report was a phenomenal report. I read it last year. It's as good as anything that's ever been done, and it absolutely stands the test of time. Their arguments and their analysis are fantastic. And in fact, at the time, as many as that. I got 10 more minutes. Oh, all right, I'll discourse a little. Right. You should have told me earlier. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, where was I? I was talking, yes, so at the time, um, there was some sympathy in the Blair government, particularly David Blunkett, the Home Secretary, who you know, was the f first and only Home Secretary to actually tell the truth about what he thought about drugs, which he said was ridiculous. In those days, cannabis was either Class A or Class B, depending on the formulation. So the oils were Class A and the, the plants, had, you know, resin, etc., was Class B. And uh, he allowed the ACMD, I was part of that group, to review the harms of cannabis. And we all agreed it should be reduced, downgraded, all to Class C. And that was, uh, that, that was accepted by the government. Uh, and uh, I think in October, 
2004. And then in January 2005, all hell let loose, because the change date was Feb 1st of February uh, 2005. And the month of January, every, all the right-wing newspapers attacked us and the government with hysteria about the downgrading. And there was a huge pressure for us to change our minds and upgrade. And we said, no, no, absolutely not. Uh, so we downgraded it. But the, the pressure didn't stop. A blanket was sacked for, uh, I can't remember what now, but he was sacked. And then they, they brought in the next Home Secretary, Charles Clark. He said to us, look, guys, you've got it wrong on cannabis. Would you redo the review and get it right this time? And we said, what, you mean make it legal? And he, no, no, he said, <laughs> So we redid the review, and it, we said it still should say as Class C. And then there was more hysteria, and um, and then uh, he was sacked, and then along came um, uh, who was who was actually uh, the next one was John Reed, who basically didn't care anything about drugs. So he just thought they were a nuisance. And then Jackie Smith said, "Would you redo it again?" And we redid it again, and we came to the same conclusion. So she said. Not good enough, nut, you've got to go, you've got the wrong answer, and that's why I was sacked. Oh, by the way, I, it was ten years ago this October, and we're having a big celebration of my sacking, <laughs> to which you are all invited. And <laughs> and the reason it all changed, and I haven't got time to go into, into it, was that the, the, the right-wing press started attacking Labour as being soft on drugs, and, and Labour did exactly what the Democrats in America did. They overreacted to be harder on drugs than the Tories. Just the way, I mean, the most oppressive, the, the three strikes and you're in prison for life act in America was brought in by Clinton. So this is the, the when you've got the more liberal parties arguing to stay in power, that they've got to be harder on drugs, then you're in the really, then that's why we have such crap drug policy in this country. Anyway, so New Labour decided to get harder on drugs, and basically Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown decided to take decision making about cannabis out of the hands of, of the advisory councils and just park it in cabinet. And it stayed there until 2018 when the public at last began to realise they'd been lied to, and Billy Cordwell, with his multiple seizures, having his medical cannabis confiscated at Heathrow, and the next day going into intensive care in St. Thomas's, which is a brilliant place to put someone in intensive care. Why? Because it's opposite the House of Commons. So he could, they could look into his window fitting if they wanted to. And that was, a, that was the move eventually that made the Home Secretary decide he didn't want to have Cordwell's death on his hands. So he said, it's got to be a medicine the chief medical officer agreed. But since then, nothing has happened. And there are still only two patients. Is that five minutes? Yes. <laughs> it is a truly remarkable story. If you want to read more about it, here's an essay that I wrote. I gave a lecture, and the, one of the editors from the BNJ came along and uh, asked me to turn it into an essay. So this is, the, this is an overview. This is my take on what the history and, uh, and also the psychology. There's a huge resistance not just from bureaucrats and government, but also from doctors to medical cannabis for a number of reasons, not, list, not least of which is the fact that they didn't invent it. And, you know, as I say to doctors, say, well, how can we be sure it works? I say, well, why don't you trust your patients? Well, if we did that, you know. Anyway, I just want to finish. This is my last slide. Talk about drug science. So the, one of the things drug science did a few years ago was take on the WHO and and challenge them to review the status of cannabis internationally. It was a fascinating meeting. I went to the, to the hearing. We forced it onto the agenda in the 2016 Expert Committee on Drug Dependence. And uh, while we were there, we asked them if we could see the reports on which they relied to tell us that cannabis didn't have any medical value. And they said, no, you can't see those reports. And we said, well, surely, we, you know, you can't tell us it has no medical value uh, based on a report if you can't show us the report. Why can't you show us the report? They said, we lost it. <laughs> and in fact, that report was in 1934. It was under the League of Nations before the WHO was formed. They were relying on a 1934 report to tell us it had no medical value. It was outrageous 
Um, but this is the international conspiracy, again, largely driven by the US, but also the, the Russia uh, and um, China and Japan are all complicit. All these countries which are vehemently prohibitionist, all comp they all get together and agree that there won't be a rational debate. The WHA, we forced them in the end. They, did a, they had a proper review uh, of medical cannabis last November. They still haven't produced the report because we're pretty certain it says it is a medicine and we're pretty certain that the US and Russia and China don't want that to be made public. Anyway, we've got medicine, medi medical cannabis in Britain, uh, but we're not using it. So what are we doing? So our charity drug science has decided to take this on. This is our big challenge over the next few years. We've set up a medical cannabis working group. We've got patient organizations. We've got academics. We've got people that make, and that make, that can make available medical cannabis. And we are basically trying to get medical cannabis into the NHS. So we're, the way to do that, we think, is set up networks that are led by experts, academic experts, that will do studies, that will administer cannabis to people who may benefit and monitor explicitly the outcomes, not just in terms of the core symptomatology of the disorders, but also in terms of the broader benefits that cannabis gives to patients. And these are some of the disorders we're going to target. We're also developing policy documents and the other final thing to say is that we have, uh, we've decided to gain, take on the medical, medical profession says it doesn't know anything about medical cannabis, so we have produced and we were released, we were releasing at the, the start of next term, an educational slide set for medical students. You probably can't educate doctors because they don't, you know, they've passed it. But every medical student in the country will have a free access to a beautiful slide set that we put together that will teach them about medical cannabis, but also about the science, the science of the endocannabinoid system and the, the, the back story to why this isn't just some kind of recreational drug which has gone out of control, but why there is a, a, a strong evidence base for the, there being a, a biochemical a mechanism to the use of cannabis. Thank you very much.